Good morning. We'll have uh, remarks by the Secretary General and the Prime Minister, and then we'll have time for just a couple of questions. Secretary General. Prime Minister, um, dear Boris, uh, welcome back to NATO headquarters. It's always a pleasure to have you here, and uh, many thanks also uh, to the United Kingdom for being a strong, a strong and staunch ally, which really contributes to our uh, collective defence in many different uh, ways. We have just addressed Russia's military build-up in and around Ukraine. Russia has already massed well over 100,000 combat ready troops with heavy equipment, missiles and key enablers such as command and control and medical units. And we are closely, closely monitoring Russia's deployment in Belarus, which is the biggest since the end of the Cold War. This is a dangerous moment for European security. The number of Russian forces is going up. The warning time for a possible attack is going down. NATO is not a threat to Russia, but we must be prepared for the worst, while remaining strongly committed to finding a political solution. The UK is playing a leading role, delivering both militarily and diplomatically. I welcome your offer of more troops, ships and planes to NATO. And the additional troops that you are deploying to Poland showed Allied solidarity in action. <clears throat> the UK leads NATO's battle group in Estonia. You contribute to NATO's air policing and the aircraft carrier HMS Prince of Wales leads NATO's maritime high readiness force. All of this sends a clear message that we will defend and protect all allies. We also have active diplomacy right across the alliance with NATO leaders working to get Russian, Russia to de-escalate. I welcome your support to Ukraine as well as your recent contact with President Putin and the visit of Foreign Secretary Trust to Moscow today. This morning, I have sent a letter to Foreign Minister Lavrov, reiterating my invitation to Russia to continue our dialogue in a series of meetings in the NATO-Russia Council to find a diplomatic way forward. We are prepared to listen to Russia's concerns and ready to discuss ways to uphold and strengthen the fundamental principles of European security that, have, uh, that we all have signed up to. We have proposed mutual briefings on exercises and nuclear policies, ways to increase transparency and reduce risks in military activities, reduce space and cyber threats, and a serious conversation on arms control, including nuclear weapons and ground-based intermediate and shorter range missiles. These areas represent an agenda for meaningful dialogue. But NATO will not compromise on core principles. The right uh, of each nation to choose its own path and NATO's ability to protect and defend all allies. Next week, NATO defense ministers will uh, assess options for further strengthening allied security. <clears throat> this includes the possibility of additional battle groups in the southeastern part of our alliance. Renewed Russian aggression will lead to more NATO presence, not less. So, Prime Minister, thank you again for the United Kingdom's strong commitment to our transatlantic alliance and for your strong personal commitment to NATO. So, once again, welcome. Jens, uh, thank you very much for, for welcoming us today to, to NATO and great to see you again uh, as ever. When NATO was founded, uh, more than 75 years ago, its members made a commitment to collective security that was unlike anything in previous history. And when the Berlin Wall fell, the people of Europe made clear that they wanted their freedom and their security to be inextricably tied together. And that's why NATO agreed that any country should be free to pursue the security alliances that it, that country, chose. And we must resist, we must oppose 
any return to the days when the fates of nations are decided over their heads by a handful of great powers. And I want to stress that this is not just about Russia, just as NATO itself is not just about Russia. Of course not. This is about upholding the founding principles of an alliance which, perhaps more than any other institution, has brought stability and peace, prosperity to the world. And that must be the bedrock of our diplomatic efforts. The UK's commitment to European security is unconditional and immovable. We have the biggest defence budget in Europe and the second largest in NATO. We've contributed more troops than any other ally to NATO's enhanced forward presence. And today I've agreed with the Secretary General a package of support to strengthen further our collective security, sending troops, planes and ships to defend NATO from north to south. Earlier this week I met the <coughs> Prime Minister of Lithuania. I'll be travelling shortly to Poland. And these are countries where every day the population wakes with a, an acute awareness of the threat just across their border. And they are countries whose voices and views must be at the heart of every discussion we have. Because I believe that if we can keep a strong grip on the fundamentals, those fundamental principles that define our alliance and combine strong deterrence with patient diplomacy, then we can find a way through this crisis. But uh, the stakes are very high, and this is a very dangerous moment. And at stake are the rules that protect every nation, every nation, big and small. Thank you, Jens. Thank you all very much. I think we should probably have some questions from the media. I think we're, I think we're going to go to... Sorry, okay. I'm going to hand yeah. it. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Sky News. Beth Rigby. Of questions. Prime Minister, two weeks ago you said the intelligence was particularly gloomy when asked about the inevitability of a Russian invasion into Ukraine. Since then, the combination of the threat of sanctions, deploying uh, troops to Eastern allies, diplomacy has failed to de escalate this situation. Are you coming to the conclusion that President Putin actually wants this war? And to the Secretary-General, you just said that this was a dangerous moment for European security. Different allies from France to the UK to the US are taking slightly different approaches to dealing with Russia. Are you concerned about these different approaches sending mixed messages to Russia? And are you worried that differences between partners could hinder any NATO deployment? Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Beth. Look, I, I think that this is, um, to, to answer your question directly about what I think is going on in Moscow and the calculations that are being made there, uh, I, don't, I honestly don't think a decision has yet been taken. But that doesn't mean uh, that it is uh, impossible that something absolutely disastrous could happen very soon indeed. And our intelligence, I'm afraid to, 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 to say, remains... Grim, and we're seeing uh, the massing of, uh, of huge numbers of, uh, of uh, tactical battalion groups, uh, battalion tactical groups on the on the borders of, of Ukraine, uh, 70 uh, or more. This is probably the most dangerous moment, uh, I would say, in the, in the course of the next few days, in what is the uh, biggest security crisis that. Uh, Europe has faced for, for decades and uh, we've got to get it right and I think that the combination of uh, sanctions and uh, military resolve plus diplomacy is are, are what is in order and everybody understands the, the you, are, you ask about whether uh, we're, we're at one across the West on sanctions I think increasingly actually we are at one and I think that I, I congratulate uh, Olaf Scholz uh, of, of Germany on the way he's been able to move towards 
a, a tougher position on, uh, on Nord Stream 2, difficult though obviously that is uh, for Germany and for the, for the German economy. Uh, I think that the UK has been able to help to bring people together with, a, with an automatic package of sanctions that would hit uh, Russian commercial uh, and strategic, uh, strategic commercial interests. Uh, the tougher those sanctions are, the more automatic they are, the more chance we have of, of deterring what I think would be an irrational response. But uh, what we're also doing is uh, ensuring that we have a uh, – we engage uh, the Russians' attention, uh, we occupy their bandwidth, uh, and uh, we get ready all over the eastern frontier of NATO. And that's why uh, Jens was kind enough to mention all the things that, uh, that we're doing. We're, we're supporting Operation uh, Cold Response in, uh, up in the north, in the, in the, in the Norway area, with uh, the Prince of, HMS Prince of Wales, a 16 Air Assault Brigade. Uh, in Estonia, we're doubling the, uh, the presence at Tapa, the enhanced forward presence at Tapa. Uh, in Poland, we're adding, uh, where I'll be going shortly, we're adding another 300, uh, 350 uh, troops from 4-5. Uh, Commando, we're doing air policing in Romania, uh, increasing the number of typhoons that we're deploying out of, uh, out of Cyprus uh, by a, 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 a squadron of typhoons, and we're sending ships to the eastern Mediterranean and the, and the Black Sea, an OPV and a, 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 and a Type uh, 45. And that's, uh, as I think uh, as Jens referred to, we're also uh, putting on standby a thousand troops uh, in preparation for a, a humanitarian crisis that may take place on NATO's uh, eastern uh, frontiers. So we're, we're getting ready uh, a military, uh, we're making military preparations, we're getting ready economic sanctions, uh, but we're also uh, willing to, to talk. And I think, I think Jens summed it up uh, very well in, in, in what he said. Uh, you know, there, there are some things that are non-negotiable. Uh, that's the idea of a Europe whole and free. That's the idea that uh, NATO must have an open door policy, that uh, the people of Ukraine must be able to aspire to NATO membership. And then, of course, there are things that it would be sensible to talk about and things that uh, NATO and, and the UK, the US, everybody is willing certainly to, to discuss. And they include transparency about NATO exercises, uh, about NATO force posture, uh, about the, the, the stationing of, of missiles, uh, making progress on, uh, certainly, as, as, as Jens said, on uh, the, uh, the INF uh, uh, area where, where Russia is, uh, is in breach, and making progress on intermediate nuclear uh, missiles. All those are, are subjects for discussion, and far, far better to begin a discussion now uh, than to uh, have a catastrophe. So that's what, that's what we're pushing for, and uh, there's a lot of, uh, of, of effort going in on all those fronts. But Beth, you know, whether it's going to pay off now, uh, whether we're going to be successful, uh, I simply can't say. Then on uh, the unity of the alliance, I think what we have seen <clears throat> over the last uh, weeks and months is actually a very united uh, NATO, where we stand together both when it comes to our diplomatic efforts, but also when it comes to the necessary military adaptation we have uh, implemented. On the diplomatic efforts, all allies agree that we need to uh, sit down with Russia to engage in good faith uh, in uh, talks uh, to try to find a political, uh, peaceful uh, solution to the conflict. And that's the reason why um, we have invited Russia for meetings in the format of the NATO-Russia Council, why I welcome that uh, uh, NATO allies as the United Kingdom, but also other allies engage directly with their distresses in Moscow uh, today, uh, and other allies have reached out uh, because we need uh, a broad approach when it comes to uh, our diplomatic uh, efforts um, with, uh, with Russia. But this is based on a unified message, which all NATO allies has agreed. Uh, we agreed a comprehensive document uh, which we sent over to Russia as, uh, as our common response, our, as our united response to the uh, legally binding uh, uh, treaties that Russia proposed for us uh, some weeks ago. Uh, and this is the agreed basis, this is the agreed message, exactly as Boris uh, said. Uh, <clears throat> we list areas where we're ready to sit and discuss on arms control, missiles, nuclear, many other issues. The point is that it has to be verifiable and balanced. 
Uh, and then we list also uh, some areas where we cannot make compromises, especially the right for every nation to choose its own path and the right, of course, for NATO to defend and protect uh, all uh, allies. This idea that, uh, that we should introduce some kind of second-class allies, those allies that have joined NATO after 1997, uh, is absolutely not acceptable uh, for us. But, but verifiable, balanced arms control, that's something we absolutely are in favour of and ready to engage in uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Russia. Um, uh, let me just briefly also add that uh, the military uh, adaptation uh, sends a clear si signal that, that, that Russia has a choice. They can either choose a diplomatic solution, and we are ready to sit down, but if they choose confrontation, they will pay a high price. There will be economic sanctions. There will be um, uh, uh, increased uh, NATO military presence in the eastern part of the alliance. The UK is really... Uh, pa an important part of that, uh, all the announced uh, uh, new deployments uh, on top of what the uh, UK has already um, uh, deployed in the eastern part of the alliance. And of course the Ukrainian army, defence force, is much stronger now uh, than they were in 2014, uh, because uh, they are better equipped, better trained, better command, and, uh, uh, and, and I welcome that United Kingdom and other allies uh, provide support to the Ukrainian uh, defence forces uh, so they can defend themselves. This is a right for every nation to defend themselves for self-defence. And, uh, and it's good that NATO allies like the United Kingdom uh, help Ukraine to, to uphold that uh, uh, right. We'll go to Laura Kunzberg from BBC. Um, thank you very much. Um, Prime Minister, how much further are you prepared to commit the UK on top of what's already happening. Would you, for example, in the case of an invasion, give UK military support to some kind of insurgency? And if you were found to have broken the law, would you resign? And can I ask you to address this directly on behalf of people at home? It's not yes, a I hypothetical no, I question. I understand. Um, there is a police investigation. Um, and Secretary General, Russia is massing, as you said, more than 100,000 troops. Allies are, like the UK, committing 1,000 here and 1,000 there. But is the scale of NATO's attempt to protect Ukraine anything like a match for what Russia may be planning? Yeah. So, so first of all, I mean, on your, on your, on your point about uh, what's going, going on at home, uh, Laura, that process must be uh, completed, and I'm looking forward to it being uh, completed, and, and that's the time to, to say more on, on that. But uh, on, on your uh, question about what we can do uh, to support Ukraine further, Everybody knows that the UK has been, <clears throat> you know, forward-leaning, out in front in offering support to, to the Ukrainian uh, military. And uh, Jens is right in what he says, uh, that I, the, the Ukrainian army is, is now very large, probably 200,000, uh, probably 150,000 reservists. And it's my judgment, I think it's certainly the judgment of NATO, that they will fight and they will resist very, very strongly. And they've been helped in, uh, in their preparations for something as catastrophic as, as this, with a lot of training from the UK Operation Orbital, as you know, has been going on since 2014. We trained 22,000 uh, Ukrainian uh, soldiers. Uh, we're, we're, we're now, in the last uh, two or three months, we've sent uh, some, uh, some anti-tank weaponry, the N-Laws, as, as you know, 2,000 of them. Uh, we will consider what uh, more we, can, uh, we could conceivably offer. But I have to tell you uh, that, uh, you know, the, the Ukrainians are well prepared. There, there are things that uh, we've offered that they, in fact, don't seem to, to need because they think that they have them uh, in enough, uh, 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 enough numbers already. So uh, it's possible. I don't want to rule this out, but uh, at the moment we think that the package is, uh, is, is the right one. Um, but I, I just want to, to stress that it would be an absolute disaster if it were to come to that and if uh, there were to be serious bloodshed on Ukrainian soil. And I know that uh, people in Russia uh, must be thinking about this too. And I know that in the Kremlin uh, and across Russia, uh, they must be wondering whether it is really sensible to expend the blood of uh, Russian soldiers in a, in a war uh, that I think is, uh, would be catastrophic and also uh, a pointless, tragic and, and vastly economically costly to, to Russia. And um, 
all I would say is that this is the moment now to think of uh, another way forward. And uh, President Putin talks about the indivisibility of security across the, the European continent, uh, by which he means that uh, Russia can't be threatened by anything that NATO does. Well, look, I want to stress that NATO is not a threatening, uh, intimidating or aggressive alliance. That is not what NATO does. NATO has kept the peace in our continent for so long and achieved so much by being a defensive alliance. That's what NATO does. And uh, you can't promote the, uh, the indivisibility of peace in the European uh, landmass by, by putting 130,000 troops on the borders of, of Ukraine. So I think there's an opportunity uh, to, and, and to, to, on all the subjects that Jens just described. I think it's a very good opportunity for us to put our heads together and try to find ways of reassuring Russia without compromising those fundamental principles of NATO's open door policy. I think there is a way through, but it must also be accompanied by a de-escalation from Russia and uh, a withdrawal of the threats that we're currently seeing. So I think it's time to de-escalate and to talk. I'm going to, I, I understand, but I'm going to, I, we're going to wait for the process to be completed. NATO is a defensive alliance and uh, our purpose is to preserve peace, uh, to prevent conflict. And we do that by standing together, uh, stating clearly, uh, as it is in China, our founding treaty, that an attack on one ally will trigger the response from the whole alliance, one for all, all for one. And that's exactly what we do, what we're doing now. Uh, at this very uh, critical time for European uh, security. Uh, um, and the question was whether we are doing enough. Well, I think we understand that we are doing many things at the same time. First of all, we have already increased the presence in the eastern part of the alliance uh, with more troops, uh, with uh, battle groups, uh, also with uh, uh, the, the UK uh, aircraft or sorry, carrier strike group and also an American uh, carrier strike group. And, and more ships, more planes, the uh, increased presence in the eastern part of the alliance. Second, we have increased the readiness of forces so we can quickly reinforce if needed. Uh, this is NATO response force, but that has been augmented by announcement from uh, the United Kingdom, from, uh, from the United States, from Denmark, from other countries, uh, 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 who have made it um, uh, clear that they are ready to to, to uh, assign more troops to the NATO response force so we can reinforce quickly um, uh, if needed. And we have increased the readiness of these forces uh, compared to their normal readiness levels. And thirdly, we are also now uh, looking into whether we should have a more long-term change in our posture in the eastern part of the alliance. Today we have battle groups in the Baltic countries and, um, and Poland. Um, the UK is leading the battle group in, in Estonia, um, but also increasing its presence in Poland. But we are now also considering to have uh, similar battle groups, uh, for instance, uh, in the Black Sea region in Romania. So, partly all of the increased presence, partly increased readiness, so we can uh, quickly reinforce, and also uh, now looking into more long-term uh, changes in our uh, posture in the eastern part of the alliance. Thank you very much. Good. This concludes this press conference. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Then, uh, boys, we can do the last uh, fist bump.